Ladies and gentlemen, the John Grammaticus rant. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Okay, a simple wrong would have done just fine. I'm Corona the Harlequin, and now that I'm at least two hours into the End in the Death Volume 3, I think I should get this video out of the way now because it will probably be the last or if not one of the last ones I make before the big video drops. So what better video to make to fill the time than the single most requested video in the entirety of my channel's history, and that's my own fault. And as such, now has finally come the time to bite that bullet. That annoying, tone-killing, poorly defined bullet. But before we get into it, thank you so much for watching this video. Please subscribe if you have not already done so. And without further ado, let's get into the worst character in all of Warhammer 40,000. Now, first and foremost, who is John Grammaticus? Well, he is a character that we have been following since the very beginning of the Horus Heresy. Not the very beginning, but very early on, in terms of the book series at least. However, he has been active in the goings-on of the heresy before it even began. You see, John Grammaticus started his life as a normal human, a soldier in one of the Emperor's armies during the Unification Wars. However, he would eventually die, and be resurrected by an alien group known as the Cabal. This would actually happen after he personally met the Emperor, because the Emperor could sense something in him. Because you have to remember, he's just so special. You know, the Emperor who never asks for help, and never really takes advice from anybody, yeah, he wanted to personally seek out John Grammaticus and shake his hand. And presumably the only reason he did this is because John is a Logokine, that being a form of Psyker who can basically understand any language he hears and speak it back. Which, yeah, that's a pretty cool ability, but does that really warrant the attention of the Emperor of all people? I don't think so. Not that it would even matter, because he actually would get killed shortly after the meeting by being hit by a car. He literally had a chance encounter with Truck Coon and got effectively isekai'd into being an important character. And that's a very important analogy, considering some of the things I'm going to say about him later on down the line. This is where the Cabal would come into play. He would wake up in their clutches and be offered a position as effectively a galactic secret agent doing their bidding, oftentimes killing people and just generally gathering the information they need, collecting identities along the way, something he would become very adept at, as well as using his talents as a Logokine to blend in. That's actually pretty interesting. And we first learn about him and his abilities in the book Legion by Dan Abnett, the seventh book in the series. And I'm gonna say something that may discredit me and will get me made fun of. He's actually pretty entertaining in this book, because he is the kind of character that fits. You see, Legion is probably one of the best books in the Horus Heresy, and it's the first one I read, so it's what really got me to reading the series. Before I had it discounted as, oh, I know what happened, so I don't need to read it, but Legion really got me into it. You see, that book is basically a four to five way spy novel, where all these different sides are withholding information from each other and carrying out their own agendas, some sides are working with other sides, some are working on their own entirely, it's a mess, but Dan Abnett actually sticks it perfectly, and I have seen books mess this sort of thing up hard. Now, John in this book serves as one of, if not the main characters, the real POV. And here's the thing, it works well because he doesn't come across as annoying. He doesn't come across as all-powerful. He's just good at what he does. He's well-trained. He's being used as a vessel to introduce us to the Alpha Legion, which works really well. We see how good of a spy he is, and we see how much better the Legion are than him, so it really says a lot about them without giving too much away about them. Furthermore, he's realistically written. He's a person, he has needs, he has feelings, but he's the kind of person you can see is jaded and has been through a lot. He doesn't come across like an annoying teenager like he does in other books. You see him having to mentally work through things and use his genuine cunning in order to get through situations and make his way forward as the situation gets worse and worse. And while yes, he can be sarcastic and says kinda funny things, 
They don't feel like quippy one-liners. They feel like genuine, bitter retorts. Like this is dark humor from someone who's been through a lot. And this is my problem with the character at the core. He is over a thousand years old but he does not act like it. In the book Legion, you can kind of sense it. You can really see it. He's losing touch with humanity, but it hasn't been completely bled out of him. And to this effect, he is a master manipulator, knowing enough about humans to manipulate them and control them, but not being close enough to the baseline race in order to truly care or really stop himself from doing it. He's a complicated character in Legion, and it's really appealing. And when he dies at the end of it by walking out of an airlock after he has effectively secured the allegiance of the Alpha Legion to the Cabal's plan, which is to facilitate the victory of Horus Lupercal because they believe he will lead the galaxy into galactic collapse and wipe out the entire human race as he succumbs to his guilt and the power enveloping him. And with the human race gone, chaos would be starved of its main food source, that being human emotion and souls, and would eventually dissipate, causing the warp to clear and become calm, and just letting it reset itself without humanity. The race would die, but the galaxy would live. And it makes sense why John would understand this and agree with it. He has a long view of things. He's a thousand years old and has been influenced by the Cabal for that long. And as such, again, you're going to be on board with it, you're going to lose touch with the race, that sort of thing. So having him go along with it, but also being guilty enough to try and off himself, I think is a really good way to go about it. And this is also the only time we get to see his combat abilities, because he is incredibly well trained and has been trained for, again, a millennia. He can basically take down some of the best members of the Imperial Guard, Lucifer Blacks, who are basically, again, the very pinnacle of mortal human soldiery in the Imperium, not that easily, but certainly capably. And furthermore, we do get to see some of his petulance in the book Legion. After he's almost discovered by the head of the Lucifer Blacks, he leaves a note saying, better luck next time, and then realizes, you know what, I shouldn't have done that, that was stupid. Because, again, he is still human, but he's not an annoying piece of shit. And furthermore, it actually blows up in his face, because the handwriting on that note, as well as the fact that he was confident enough to leave a note, really gives away who he is, his identity is discovered, and his entire mission is nearly blown. He's not perfect, but he's still really good at what he does. Now, the reason I go over all of this is to illustrate just how far the character falls in every successive appearance. His next major appearance is a bit part in the book No No Fear by Dan Abnett again. He's basically Dan Abnett's brainchild, and a lot of people think he's Abnett's self-insert. I don't really think so, but still, like, Abnett, come on. The big thing about the book No No Fear, which is again really, really good, is that it covers the Battle of Kalth, where the word bearers would ambush the Ultramarines, and more importantly, introduces us to Alanius Persson, the Emperor's old friend, former War Master, and likely the oldest living human in the galaxy. John contacts him in secret because it seems like he's decided to turn against the Cabal and he needs some sort of help. So he gets in touch with Persson through his dreams, basically trying to nudge him into acting. And here's the thing, this is where the cracks start to show, because how can he do that? It is said over and over again as the series goes on that John Grammaticus' only natural gift is being logokinetic everything else he has been given by the Cabal. And even then, when he communicates long distance with the Cabal, it's them contacting him, usually by appearing in reflective surfaces to talk to him directly. And again, this is not something he is shown to be capable of doing, nor is it said he can do it. Again, it's only said he is a Logokine and nothing else. Everything else he can do is natural human ability an understanding of human psychology, the ability to lie and manipulate very effectively, high combat skill, that sort of thing. But this comes out of nowhere. The ability to astral project into Olanius Persson's dreams, who is on the other side of the galaxy for all we know? How does he do that? This is really the birth of the biggest criticism against John Grammaticus I see other people have, which isn't a narrative one. That being he is a quote-unquote Mary Sue, or Gary Stu, or whatever you want to say. Because he just does things. He just ends up in places. 
When he is part of the human forces on the planet of Nerth in the book Legion, we can assume he has been there for a long time and has been planning this out and has been helped by the Cabal, that sort of thing. And his abilities at least make sense and line up. This comes completely out of nowhere and it's only downhill from here because he does then reappear in the Vulcan arc, which is generally known as one of the weakest story beats across the entire Horus heresy. This being, in this instance, the books Vulcan Lives, Unremembered Empire, and Old Earth. There are more books to the Vulcan arc, but again, he doesn't appear in all of them. Now, the big problem with Vulcan Lives is that it is a mess through and through. It covers so many storylines, that being Vulcan on Istvan V, Vulcan after Istvan V after he's been captured by Conrad Kurz. Those two story beats actually do happen at the same time, yeah a group of salamanders and iron hands, and a group of word bearers, some of whom are evil, one of whom is Barthus Anarik, a loyalist word bearer, well, one who at least becomes loyalist, and John Grammaticus. You see, he starts off on this planet, looking for something for the Cabal. That thing we find out is a fulgurite, a crystallized shard of the Emperor's power. A fulgurite is a kind of stone that forms when lightning strikes sand, you get the idea. Because the Cabal specifically wants him to get it, so that he can use it to finally kill Vulcan, who is himself a perpetual. And it's such a weird plotline, and it should say a lot that despite my fixation on this character in regard to how much I hate him, I barely remember what happens here. I know he ends up in the company of a bunch of Shattered Legion forces, mainly salamanders, but I don't remember if he found the Fulgurite, or if it was the word bearers who found it first. What happens in the end is that John Grammaticus escapes with it. However, his big thing is he is contacted while in the company of several Salamanders, Iron Hands, and Raven Guard by none other than Eldrad Ulthran through one of those reflective surfaces. And this actually brings up a plot hole for Eldrad, because he had vowed in the book Fulgrim to never deal with humans in any way that wasn't actively hostile because of how badly his meeting with Fulgrim went and how many of his people died because of it. So he just cordially greets John through the mirror and just talks to him normally, but hey, I digress. And here's the thing, he convinces John to abandon the Cabal, to stop being a quote-unquote traitor to his race, and side with him, because he foresees John can heal Vulcan with the Fulgurite of his madness. Because Vulcan will be holding the line, as far as Eldrad sees, in the webway and aiding the Imperial Defenders. Something that does come to pass, so I'm glad somebody was finally right. However, John just accepts this outright without really questioning it and pushing back at all. He's like, okay, sure, I'll do that now. Like, he just trusts another Eldar, even though it had previously been an Eldar that was screwing him over in Slauda. And when he's in the company of these salamanders, he just blunders around. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't manipulate any of them or influence any events. He just sits there shaking in his boots while they run rings around him, and then eventually has to reveal that he was never working with them and has to kill one of them and says, sorry, you guys were in my way, while he escapes. And furthermore, he comes face to face with Erebus, who gives him the Fulgurite. And that's never properly explained. He's just like, sure, you want it? Take it. But he doesn't have proper divination. You think he might as well just keep it for himself. He's Erebus. But he just lets John leave. And furthermore, he doesn't kill him when he has a clear shot. Another one of Erebus's many sins. That's just a joke. I love Erebus. And the big thing is, this is such a departure from how he acts in the book Legion, his previous major appearance. Because there he was competent, sneaky, a consummate professional, and here he's just blundering around like an idiot. You could have told me this is some random person that the Cabal has just signed on and is now going through the motions and trying to figure out what to do, and I'd still believe you. He just feels like a nobody, like an incompetent Marvel character. And that's the big thing people say about John Grammaticus. He does not act like a thousand-year-old professional, he acts like a goddamn Marvel character just saying random things, making sarcastic one-liners at Eldrad Othran, and at the salamander he just betrayed and stabbed in the back. Nothing like, oh, I'm sorry, or if only you could understand, or I'm sorry I have to do this, or just anything. He just says, sorry, you were in my way, in that exact voice. He is voiced pretty decently in Legion, but everywhere thereafter, his voice is so annoying in the audiobooks. I think it's cool he has an American accent, the only character to have one in basically the entire book of British people, but it has this stupid as shit nasal inflection. Sorry, it's me, John Grammaticus. 
well, I'm really doing my best here. And oh my god. I, it's just so grating to listen to after a while because it just accentuates this feeling that he's acting like an annoying teenager. And furthermore, we often get these instances right after something really important has just happened. This is another thing people often complain about with John Grammaticus, and something that makes me gnash my teeth every time he comes up. Whenever a book shifts to his perspective or his B story, everything comes to a screaming halt. He is never part of the main goings on. He always has this parallel line where he's adjacent to everything happening in his own way. Because if you had him thoroughly part of it, it would be clear how annoying and useless he is. This way he can at least seem important in his own little bubble. However, again, that pulls the entire focus of the book away from something that is oftentimes more interesting and more important. In Vulcan Lives, we will go from instances where Vulcan is going one-on-one -on -one with Conrad Kurz, being tortured to death time and again, and trying so hard to maintain his spirit while Conrad continually tries to break him down. And then in the next moment, we get John Grammaticus bantering with some mercenaries who think he's an archaeologist. I am not against multiple storylines, far from it. I think it helps Black Library books distinguish themselves and pace themselves and gives us more bang for our buck without dragging out the main story. However, they all need to move at the same pace. They have to be consistent. And again, it's not a crime to go from a high tension storyline to a lower tension one, as long as they are effectively moving at the same pace and are equally interesting. It doesn't work with John Grammaticus because when you go from what's happening with Vulcan or what's happening with Gilman and Lionel Johnson to his boring ass, it feels like we've just backslided so far in the narrative. It doesn't feel like it's moving at the same pace and now we're suddenly bored listening to this idiot drone on and on. And it also highlights the problem of other characters being introduced just to bend the narrative around him and give him things to do. You see, in Unremembered Empire, we catch up with another perpetual in the employ of the Cabal, who we met once before in the book Betrayer, albeit only briefly. That being Daemon Prytanis. Now, Daemon Prytanis is also very, very old as a perpetual. We don't know how old he is, but he's old enough that he was first recruited by the Cabal during the Battle of Iwo Jima. And a little aside here, he canonically shot MLK. I made a short about this once before, but I'll say it again here because it bears repeating. He is stated to have, at the behest of the Cabal, shot people like the good man in Memphis or the brother in the City of Angels. You know, Bobby Kennedy. And funny thing, we know who shot Bobby Kennedy. He's still alive in jail. He was a Palestinian Christian who shot him because Bobby Kennedy had supported an arms deal to Israel. So like, what did the Cabal mean by that? And I know this is more of a joke about Black Library's tone deafness, but still, the fact that characters get introduced like this, in storylines that center around John Grammaticus, kind of makes him the lightning rod for all the frustration and incredulity that comes with characters like these. But I will say this, Damon Prytanis is a better character than John Grammaticus, because he has that attitude and outlook you would expect someone like John Grammaticus to have after all these years. Damon Prytanis is, at minimum, around 30,000 years old. So, he lived through all of human history, he lived through the Dark Age of Technology, and now he lived through the Unification Wars, and the Great Crusade, and now the Heresy. And he's very detached from humanity. He doesn't really view himself as human in any capacity. So, if John Grammaticus was more like him, more jaded, more sarcastic without being annoying, sort of that gallows humor kind of guy, it would fit better because, again, John is a thousand years old and has seen a lot. And now's probably as good a time as any to revisit an issue that was previously plaguing John Grammaticus, that being his inconsistent powers. Because, again, it has been stated that he is only a natural logokine and that everything else comes from the Cabal but we never see him actually display any of these abilities in books like Legion. And when I say these abilities, I mean the powers he exhibits other than Logokinesis, such as his long-distance communication with Alanius Pearson, as well as what he does here. Because before, he had to be really subtle about how he presented himself in order to maintain cover. He had to actually secret agent shit. But here, he doesn't do that. He just uses his mental psychic powers to manifest a giant radiation burn mark on his face to pretend he was at Kalth, because Kalth refugees are now headed to Ultramar. Gee, you couldn't have done that when you were on the run from the Lucifer Blacks? And furthermore, he basically just pulls a Jedi mind trick. 
His name isn't in any registry, or on any cards, or on any ID, or anything. But he basically just effectively, again, does a Jedi mind trick on an Ultramarine Sergeant in order to get past security and make his way to the planet. Gee, if only he could have done that when he was captured by Ingo Peck or Matthias Herzog, the Alpha Legionaries who are on his tail in the book Legion. Where does this come from? It just appears out of nowhere whenever it's convenient. He can just do things. He just has skills randomly that we never see. And he never does this again. And yes, that's because an opportunity never presents itself, but that right there is bad writing. To just introduce a random ability with no explanation, and then literally just never show it again. What made him interesting in the book Legion was to see how he logics his way out of situations, and how he applies the skills we know he has. But here, there's no tension reading about him, because he's just gonna BS his way through any situation. And furthermore, we get a lot more action with Damon Prytanis in the short time we know him than we do with John. John barely does anything outside of the book Legion, aside from, you know, kung fuing down a Lucifer Black. But Damon Prytanis literally goes commando on people with two Eldar Shuriken pistols, mastering their firing technique taking out everybody left, right, and center, going up against Primarchs himself. Yeah, he literally fights Conrad Kurz while John just sits on his ass. Now, again, Prytanis is not a perfect character himself, but he's more understandable as opposed to John, who just isn't. So if these two characters could have been, I don't know, hybridized in a way, to make someone with Prytanis' personality, but John's moral system, there could be something there that might have actually worked. And what happens in the book, Unremembered Empire, is that John Grammaticus fully commits to his change away from the Cabal and towards Eldrad's plan. But here he's more of a quote-unquote partner as opposed to a bootlick. And he does this by stabbing the Fulgurite into Vulcan's chest, thereby killing them both, but in a way that Vulcan can still resurrect and be cured of his madness that he had after being tortured by Conrad Kurz for so long and removing John's perpetuality. In reality, the Cabal wanted John to give the Fulgurite to Kurz, so that Kurz, on Macrag, could kill Vulcan with it and thereby deny the Loyalists a Primarch. And nothing comes of this plotline. And it's things like this that make people say that the entire Cabal storyline could have just been left on the cutting room floor. It adds very, very little, aside from getting the Alpha Legion involved. And the Alpha Legion doesn't even do that much throughout the heresy. And as stated before, John becomes the lightning rod. And if nothing else, and when I say nothing else, I mean nothing else, this would have been a decent opportunity to kill John off. Realistically, he should have died at the end of the book Legion, but you could have just let him stay dead here. He sacrificed himself, Vulcan's alive, Vulcan can get to Terra, great. However, nope, because the Cabal revives him yet again, for seemingly no reason, just so that they can keep him imprisoned. Basically locked in a farm that isn't really a farm, with Damon Prytanis watching over him to keep him captive. There's no explanation as to why they do this. What do they need him for? Why not just let him die? Do they plan to interrogate him? Do they plan to get information out of him? Do they plan to just punish him? It's never touched on. However, Eldrad Ulthran once again steps in and comes to John's aid, entering that dreamlike farm and killing Damon Prytanis once and for all. This all happens in the book Old Earth, and sees Eldrad, along with that loyalist word bearer Barthusa Narek, get John Grammaticus to Terra. And it also sees Narek eventually get to Terra in his own way. And we kind of have lost track of him, like he shows up once in one line in the end of the Death Volume 1, where we hear about how he's just waiting on Terra with a bullet made of Fulgurite, because he is a sniper, and then never again. He just vanishes from the narrative, seemingly. I should note that I'm a quarter of the way through the end of the Death Volume 3, and he still hasn't been mentioned. So that's that for the heresy. It's the last we see of John, him stepping through a portal after saying, for all mankind, with Eldrad Ulthran to make his way to Terra to finish things off. And herein we can see one of the big problems with John Grammaticus as a character. He never really affects things all that much. More often than not, he's just around just doing things, and observing things, and making comments. Even when he makes a decision like saving Vulcan, that's more so to bring things to the status quo rather than just change them. Like, look at this reasonably. Having Vulcan go insane and then end up in Imperium Secundus was entirely pointless. What was gained from any of that? He honestly could have just traveled from Conrad Kurz's ship 
to Nocturne, and then to the webway with Eldrad's help, and that would have been the end of it. He would still be in the same place. But instead, we get John Grammaticus doing a bunch of random crap to basically affect nothing. And you would think this would change when he's off on his own, but it really doesn't. Because after all this, we get to the Siege of Terra, and he is completely absent from the first three books, that being the Solar War, the Lost and the Damned, and the First Wall, aside from the very last paragraph of the First Wall, where we get a view of a man falling out of a portal outside of a burning hive city on Terra, the Hive of Adaba, which is supposed to be like Addis Ababa in what is now Ethiopia. And he does so in front of an old woman, and she asks him, Hey, who are you? And he's like, oh, you seem pretty unconcerned by the fact that I just fell out of the air. And she's like, yeah, well, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen the War Masters guys, I've seen the Empress forces just destroy out of a hive, so I don't care. Who are you? It's like the goddamn ending scene of the last Star Wars movie. Rey who? Rey Skywalker. Like, come on, that's so lame. And it only gets worse with his response, because he says, My name is John and I'm on my own side. We then follow him on and off across the Siege of Terra as he very clearly picks a well-defined side. From here on out, we see him in the books Saturnine, Mortis, Warhawk, and the End in the Death books. And all the problems previously mentioned only get worse from here. Now, the first book we really have to deal with him in the Siege of Terra in force is Saturnine, which is actually one of the best books, not just in the Siege of Terra, but in the entire Horus Heresy. Yeah, there's some weird lore stuff that people don't like, like with the Sisters of Silence being basically invisible, and the death of Janisha Kroll, as well as the introduction of Erda, oh boy. But the book itself is a very, very solid, and absolutely a joy to read. It is emotional, it is tense, it is powerful, it brings up so many characters that we really are invested in, like Abaddon and the Jesteran and Horus Aximand, and it even sees Nathaniel Garrow come back in a sense. As well as giving us some great content with Garvia Loken and some absolutely amazing battle scenes, such as the last stand of Camba Diaz and in general, the fall of the Eternity Wall spaceport. And it is in the midst of this great book, we get John Grammaticus going and sitting in a tent with Erda, just babbling about nothing criticizing her for having done nothing, while he himself has been basically fucking useless and has just been a pawn of greater powers. I did not care for Erda. Really, I did not. But John just sitting there, babbling about nothing, acting like he knows her, is so pointless and stupid and just comes to nothing. Yeah, his role in this book, as just lame, is overshadowed by the whole Erda lore thing. She's suddenly the mother of the Primarchs just revealed on a whim like that. But it should be noted, he's so inconsistent because he just shows up and talks to her like he knows her, like they've spoken before, like they're familiar. But we have never once seen them interact, we've never once seen them mentioned. Furthermore, we get more hints at his relationship with Alanius Pearson and how they know each other and how they've worked together and blah blah blah, but again, we've never seen anything of these guys outside of Kalf. And even then, all it really hints at is that they fought together in the Emperor's armies during the campaigns of unification against the Pan-Pacific Empire on Terra. Let me just go on a bit of a sidetrack here actually because I'm never going to get another chance to talk about this. Why was Alanius Pius fighting in the Emperor's armies on Terra? He stabbed him all those millennia ago. He was his former war master who turned against him. But he's okay with suddenly being a foot soldier in his armies when he's trying to conquer the planet? The thing Olanius Pius didn't want him to do? And that's not even bringing up the fact that why is he still on Terra? You have been alive through the entire Dark Age of Technology when humanity had its first empire, and you didn't leave Earth then to get away from the guy? Or just go see the galaxy? You've just sat here on Terra the entire time? That's just a thing that bothers me, and I felt like I should bring it up now. But again, John Grammaticus takes away from the book Saturnine by just bumming around with Erda, talking big like he's some hotshot who's affecting change in the galaxy, even though, again, he has done nothing of note. He actually says to her, you're just upset that you've had all this time to do something, but now you're being shown up by a Johnny-come-lately. Shut up, John. It's from here we move on to the book Mortis, and I'm gonna say something that is actually gonna shoot me in the foot, because John Grammaticus is probably the most interesting part of the book Mortis. Well, at the very least him, Alanius Persson, and their little crew of people who I don't care about. Because the rest of the book is so boring. 
This book is so boring, I barely remember what happened. It is the only book in the Horus Heresy that I nearly didn't finish. I started it, gave up because I was that bored, read Warhawk, and then thought, you know what, I'm gonna regret not finishing it, then went back. I did state as much in my video about what Horus Heresy books you should read, but I will say that again because it's relevant. When John Grammaticus and Olanius Persson are the most interesting parts of your book, you've done something catastrophically wrong. And what they do here is basically just enter into a hive city that has basically become infested by Slanesh and the Emperor's children, and John comes in afterward to rescue them. And eventually, one member of the party, named Zybes, is killed because he mistakes a Slaneshi demonette for his wife, something you would have literally no context for if you hadn't read No No Fear, and again, something that is only brought up in No No Fear, so long ago. Again, Alanius Persson's companions are all pretty poorly written and just don't have much emotional purchase, so having a whole story around rescuing them and where one of them dies tragically just does not really fit. And furthermore, this is another example of us being told about John Grammaticus's abilities, but never really being shown them properly. Because when John is leading the group through the hive, he's basically going all tactical by, you know, clearing rooms and taking point with his las gun while leading them. And Olanius comments on the fact that he often forgets that John Grammaticus is probably one of the best stealth operations specialists in the entire galaxy. But you really wouldn't know that from reading the books or even just this passage. All he does is basically walk into a room with his gun up and then look around. And that suddenly makes him Black Ops Pro. Like, no. We just don't see this side of him, yet it's still told to us as a core component of John Grammaticus. And even then, he doesn't really infiltrate the Hive City in any interesting way, he just kind of blunders in. This is another example of why I say if you had fused the characters of John Grammaticus and Damon Pritanus together into one, it probably would have worked a lot better. Damon Pritanus in this scenario probably would have been a lot cooler to read about, and I could actually believe that he is a great stealth operative, as opposed to John, who just kind of blunders around everywhere, but somehow always manages to just be where the action is happening. That's basically what carries us through Mortis, the worst book in the siege, and onto Warhawk, where again, John does show up. And Warhawk is a pretty good book, I really liked it. We get a lot of good perspectives of the humans in the siege, some of the most we've gotten since The Lost and the Damned, what things are like on the front lines, how they're feeling, the different roles that humans have, as well as a lot of good White Scars lore, including characters like Zuilia and Shiban Khan, who we've grown attached to ever since The Path of Heaven and Scars, so it was really nice to see them again. And imagine how happy I was when that time with these characters I like was interrupted by John Grammaticus. You see, by this point, he and his group at the end of Mortis have met up with Cyrene under the name Akte, Cyrene being a now perpetual blessed lady of the word bearers who has suddenly reappeared in the narrative and has her own vaguely defined plans. Her story is also really weird because she also happens to be with an alpha legionary who identifies himself as Alpharius. And herein we get a funny line where this alpha legionnaire says, I am Alpharius but he's interrupted and someone tells him, if you say it, I will open this door and kill us all because they're in the middle of a plane flying over a war zone. But that's not John who says that. The quote unquote funny guy with all the zingers and quips isn't the one who actually delivers the rare funny line. It's Olanius Persson, not John. And here's the thing, what is John doing? He's literally sitting in the cockpit flying the plane, feeling fucking sorry for himself. That's not what I want in this book. We are, I, it's a White Scars book, and I love the White Scars. I'm literally getting my wah on right now, and then it just cuts to John Grammaticus going, Oh gee, I sure am useless. I'm John Grammaticus. I can't really do anything to help anyone. And that's not even a joke, because at this point, he's no longer perpetual. He doesn't have access to the resources of the Cabal, and hasn't really been showing any of those psychic powers he displayed earlier. The only real thing he has left is being logokinetic, and having one word of Enuncia that he remembers from when he was in Olanius Persson's dream, back when All was remembering his past when he stabbed the Emperor. Because All had a dream back when he and the Emperor were fighting together and destroying what was effectively the Tower of Babel, but filled with a language called Enuncia, which again, affects the very fabric of the universe when spoken. And John was able to remember a couple words because of his logokinetic power. But aside from that one word he has in his back pocket and his power, he doesn't really have much he can offer. And that's sort of weighing on him because he feels a need to help. That could be interesting, but it doesn't really come up 
because he's still effectively the team leader up until this point. Like, you don't have someone reflect on this when they're very literally flying the damn plane. You have them reflect on this when they're sitting alone at the back and everyone else has been given tasks and he's just told to take five. Not when he is actively leading everybody. Basically, by this point, their whole shtick is to get to the Imperial Palace and get to the Emperor because all needs to speak to him for whatever reason. Past this point, we get to The End and the Death, Volume 1, 2, and 3. Now, this video is already getting long, so I'll try to be brief here, but in The End and the Death, Volume 1, which I have covered in a full video along with The End and the Death, Volume 2, hope you guys liked those, but in The End and the Death, Volume 1, we catch up with John and the group because they're traveling in the passages underneath the palace that Ingo Petch, yeah, he's the Alpha Legionary, happens to know about. And that's where John's biggest contribution comes from in this book. Him talking with Ingo about Cyrene and what her plan really is, him getting some information about him, about what the Alpha Legion is doing or what's going on with them, what side they're truly on. And here we get to see some annoying quips from him because when Ingo Petch tells him, hey, what Cyrene is trying to do is take control of Horus and steer him towards chaos, because she thinks he can take control of it, that he's powerful enough. John, instead of the jaded person who's dealt with so much, responding dryly with some genuine wit or even dismissal like, yeah, of course that's what she thinks, why should anything be easy? Or responding with genuine discomfort at the fact that he is traveling with a hyper-powered lunatic, basically just looks at him and says, well then she's a colossal freaking idiot. And then when Ingo Petch explains more of what she's planning, he says, I refer you to my previous statement. And by God, my brain just rolled back into my skull. And this all ends up with them leaving the Alpha Legionary with a motion bomb taped to his chest because John Grammaticus managed to outfox him and he basically asked him to. Again, I don't want to touch on it too much. This video is already running long. They eventually get taken by the custodies and put in jail. Unfortunately, they are not left there, because then they are taken to meet Vulcan. And Vulcan actually recognizes John Grammaticus and states him as, quote, I would recognize the man who killed me, but also the man who saved me. And, you know, this would have been a cool chance to just have him killed. I was hard on this scene and made a lot of jokes about it in my video about The End and the Death Volume 1. However, it's not that bad upon reflection compared to some of the other stuff we have to deal with. And it's also noted at this point that John Grammaticus, up until this time, was the quote-unquote dynamo. He was the one who was leading the charge and bringing everybody forward, but when he starts to falter and seize up, it apparently has a lot of weight to it, because now everyone is unconfident. We don't see him as a leader and a dynamo, we just see him as their chaperone. He's basically just partly a babysitter of this group of idiots. And we also get to see him fight with Alanius Pearson in the next book, because it's revealed all never really had a plan. He was just taking this on faith. But John and him start to fight about it, he gets angry, and that's resolved in basically one second. Honestly, things are kind of starting to blur here between what happened in the palace in the end of the death volume one and two, but solidly in the end of the death volume two, we get John Grammaticus leading Olanius Pearson through the ruins of the vengeful spirit, now turned into something called the inevitable city. And herein, we get John at some of his most annoying because he gets his jaw broken by Erebus, thank you Erebus, however he still keeps talking by signing in Hort code. However, it at least controls him a little bit, until he ends up faced with the Emperor himself, now partway through his transformation into the Dark King. It makes more sense if you watch my video. And the Emperor heals all of them when he gives up his Dark King power to face Horus normally, and John is healed. We get John Grammaticus talking a lot at this point, and Olanius Pearson literally comments in his head, John was talking because he wanted to hear himself speak. Grown ass, thousand year old man, ladies and gentlemen, talking because he wants to hear himself speak. You don't do that, especially in a situation like this. You are going to face off against Horus Lupercal at the feet of the Emperor himself, and you can't shut up? You don't know when and how to shut up? You don't even comment on the fact that you have met the Emperor before and shook his hand. The last time John met the Emperor was a thousand years ago on Terra in the early stages of the Unification Wars as a mercenary where he shook his hand and had a vision of the bloody havoc he would wreak across the galaxy. That's not even brought up once here, but I think you could at least try. But like always, we're blessed with John being a little twerp. And I said as much in my notes. Another thing I said in my notes when listening to Volume 2 was the fact that 
John and All are about to part ways with the Emperor, Loken, and Lee Tu on their way to confront Horus. And my notes were, yes, please leave. And then John says, come on, All, we really better go. We'll die for sure if we go. And then my notes say, no, wait, take him with you. And then they go about tying bits of string on the path they had been following because they had been following a trail of string knots and realized those knots were placed by their future selves to guide them where we need to go. So to straighten out the timeline, they have to go back and complete the knots. And that's the last we see of them for volume two. Now, as of recording this, I am just shy of 80% of the way through the end of the death of volume three. It's about 15 hours long, I've got about three and a half hours left, and it's been slow going because I'm taking notes every step of the way. I currently have almost 8,500 words of notes. However, a little tidbit into what's happened thus far. It's a tiny one, is that when we first meet John and All in this book, we jump from a scene where Horus and the Emperor have finally engaged. They have finally begun clashing and fighting. The drama is at a pitch. The tension is all there. This is what we've waited for for 18 years. And we cut away from that to hear John say, uh, how much longer, All? Because they're still tying knots. This man is a thousand years old. And in this book, it's reinforced that John is hanging around with All because he made a promise to protect him. He views him as his protector. But that's really all he is, just his babysitter for a far more important character who is considerably more interesting despite his flaws. Just nothing comes of him. Now, I'm not going to get too far into this because, again, nearly 10,000 words of notes. But I will get into it in my video for the end of the Death Volume 3. However, that's going to be a long ways away, and by that time, the hype will probably have died down. What a shame. Really sorry for that, but I hope I can make it worth the wait for you guys. It's probably going to be a very long one, probably my longest video ever. And one more small spoiler for the book, John Grammaticus, 80% of the way in, is not yet dead. And that's something I've actually been very vocal about, is that I want him dead, but I don't want him to have some epic last words or great last stand. I want him to die in a way that's kind of pathetic. Like, I want him to get backhanded by somebody into the next dimension. And characters have died that way so far in the book, mind you. And I just want that for him. Now, I don't actually have it in me to scroll back 41 minutes because I've spent weeks recording this video because my school schedule is five days a week and leaves me very, very little breathing room and I had to start an internship. But in case I haven't mentioned it already, part of why I hate John is just how badly he botches the human element of this story. We get characters like Zarenchek Xanthus and Basilio Fo and Katsuhiro, who has kind of fallen off the face of the narrative, much to my chagrin, and Euphrati Keeler and Kirill Sinderman, and so many others who do embody the human element, both the funny lightheartedness in the face of adversity, the weight of suffering, and the human determination to keep going and stick together. However, John just embodies none of that. He's basically just a magic little cardboard cutout who has annoying one-liners. And I could live with the one-liners, that's what people often cite as makes him annoying, but it's the lack of narrative weight and just how much focus he pulls away from more important things and more impelling characters. All the crap we got about John Grammaticus would have been so much better served if it was somehow allocated to like Katsuhiro or so many other people, or Zu Ilya, who has again sort of fallen out of the narrative sadly. And you actually could have played up his relationship with Alanius Pearson much better. Alanius Pearson is the oldest living human in the galaxy, older than the Emperor himself. He's seen it all, every bit of human history, all of Earth, all of the Dark Age of Technology and the Age of Terra and the Emperor's rise to power. He's just seen it all. But John only really knows everything up until the early Unification Wars. So contrasting their deep knowledge could really give a lot of perspective into what life was like before the Emperor, before the Imperium, before the fall of Terra, because all can't really have those discussions with some of the other humans near him. They don't know any of this. They've never been to Terra. So, John has enough perspective to be able to engage with Alanius in his musings about the past while not being completely lost. But that is just not touched on between the two. There's so many missed opportunities here. And yet, people insist on holding him up as this badass character who's just so great. You know, All calls him the best stealth military operations guy in the galaxy. Ingo Peck calls him a good and moral man. Eldrad Ulthran, even at the beginning of the End of the Death Volume 2, describes him as a quote, principal agent who may still yet affect the outcome of things. We are told this time and again, but he never shows any of this. 
and that is why I believe wholeheartedly that John Grammaticus is the worst character in Warhammer. But what do you guys think? Do you guys think I'm being too hard on John Grammaticus? No, I'm not. No, you don't think that. Or do you think I should have gone harder on him? That much I will accept. Or do you have a different angle entirely? Some other reason that you hate him? A line that he said maybe that just pisses you off? I'd love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments below, especially for a video like this. And please subscribe if you have not already done so. And until then, I will see you in the next video.